Okay. We're going to pretend that it's already. So, welcome to the Director's Lecture Series. This is the first Director's Lecture Series for this year, 2014. Um, today is October 10th, and uh, welcome to the brand new building that Boston University has in the Redstone Building. This is our technology that we have. I've got 50 people here in front of me, which is the residential class at uh, BU, and there's about 100 people additionally that are going to be listening to this material because they're online students, because we have a hybrid program that's part online and part residential. But this video will probably be available on the internet also. So people that are watching that aren't part of the BU program, this is sort of how it works at BU. Um, you will get um, an audio video uh, uh, presentation here. There'll be some PowerPoint slides that you can download. That's perfectly all right. And um, if you're interested in these topics here, um, along with uh, the material that you have here, please feel free to email us or write because some of this is ongoing research right now. Some of it's in foreign languages and I don't do the best in some of these foreign languages, but we're talking about tax fraud and terrorist funding. And there's a theme here that is there are certain types of tax systems that rely on business to collect and remit the taxes paid by others and I think that they are highly vulnerable to systemic tax fraud. Um, in fact, I think they're a magnet for terrorist organizations that are looking for funding. And we'd like to talk about two of these. One of these is the retail tax, sales tax in the United States, and the other is the value added tax, which is every place in the world except the United States. Now, I know some of you don't know an awful lot about the value added tax, so I'm going to at least go back through portions of the value added tax so you can see where the problem and the fraud is. Importantly to all of this is that these frauds, the way they're being conducted right now, are highly technology-based frauds. As a result, the solution to these frauds is also technology-based. So if the criminals are into technology and they're committing frauds at various places and various mechanisms around the world, then the government perhaps needs some technology to stop the fraud. And in many instances, like in the United States and other jurisdictions, the technology of the fraud prevention is not exactly up to the technology of the fraudsters who are stealing the money. So, there are two individuals here. Um, the question is, you know one of them. Um, they both passed away. Uh, one of them was working with Hezbollah, and we're strongly suspicious that he received funding through a tax fraud in the United States. And the other one, we're pretty strongly suspicious that he received funding through a value-added tax fraud in the European Union, particularly the Italian fraud that's breaking right now. So I'm not sure, but there are strong suspicions. So what's the difference between a retail sales tax and a value-added tax? Essentially, both the retail sales tax and the value-added tax are a tax on consumption. Essentially, if I had a 10% retail sales tax and a 10% value-added tax, I would collect exactly the same amount of money. Now, the United States like the retail sales tax. So if I had a manufacturer in the United States that purchased something for $25 and they used it in the manufacturing process, looking at the top part of this diagram, then the manufacturer would take $25 worth of input, add $75 worth of value, and he would sell what he manufactured to a wholesaler for $100. There's no tax on that transaction. Then the wholesaler sells it to the retailer. He adds a little bit of value to what the wholesaler does, and he sells it to the retailer for $150. No tax on that transaction. But in the United States, once the retailer gets it for $150, he adds a little bit of value, which is 10 in this example, and he sells it to a consumer for $160, and now the retail sales tax is applied. At a 10% retail sales tax, the retailer will now collect 16 in addition to the 160. And the retailer will then remit this money to the government. So if I'm looking at the retail sales tax, it is highly vulnerable in a particular area. The retail sales tax area is the transaction between the retailer and the consumer. If I put some technology in to steal retail sales tax, I would do it at this level. Value-added tax is supposed to be a better tax, some people say. So if I had a value-added tax with 10%, what I would do is I would have the manufacturer purchasing raw materials for 25, but when he purchased his raw materials, he would have to pay a value-added tax of 10% of what he purchased, which would be 2.5. 
And then the manufacturer would add his value of 75. He'd then sell it on to the wholesaler for 100. And there would be a 10% value added tax imposed on this transaction between the manufacturer and the wholesaler. Now, what's interesting about the value added tax, different from the retail sales tax, is I'm collecting this tax early. I'm collecting it on the retailer, not just on the retailer transaction, but the manufacturer wholesaler transaction. And what the, whole, what the manufacturer will do is say, well, I sold something for 100. I collected 10 when I sold it because I sold it for 110 altogether. And I'm going to take a deduction for my input VAT. So the VAT that I paid on my inputs, which was 2.5, and the VAT that I collected on my sale to the next person in line was 10. So I remit to the government 7.5 at this stage in the transaction. It hasn't even made it to the, the, the retailer, it hasn't made it to the final consumer. So everywhere along the line in a value added tax, there is a little bit of tax collected and a little bit of tax remitted. Now, some people say this is a better system because it is an incentivized system. The wholesaler has an incentive, like the retailer has an incentive, to make sure that he knows exactly how much he paid in tax because his tax payments become a deduction on the tax that he collected from the other end. So I have very good books and records. Other people say, this is not such a good system because look, Richard, what you've got here is instead of having one person collect the tax and send it all into the government at the same time of 16, I've got five people collecting taxes. I've got five sets of tax returns. I've got five sets of books and records to, to audit. So in terms of the weight of the tax on the tax system, the value added tax is a very weighty tax. But in terms of collecting only a small bit everywhere along the, along the way, the value added tax is a good tax. If you wanted to steal value added tax, well, you can't steal 16 because nobody got the 16. You might be able to steal 2.5 or 7.5 or maybe five in this example, but the tax is collected in fragments all along the way. And I get the same amount of money at the end of the day. In both systems, I'm getting a tax of 16. In both taxes, I'm getting a tax on the final consumer because the final consumer, the person that consumes whatever this manufacturer manufactured, the final consumer is effectively paying 16 on a purchase of something for 160. So it's two ways of getting it to exactly the same point. So there is really, theoretically, not a lot of difference between a value added tax and a retail sales tax if the tax rate is the same. But they're both vulnerable to fraud, different types of fraud. So the retail sales tax fraud. Retail tax fraud is something that I've written a number of papers on, um, and it sort of happened in stages. But it used to be just plain skimming. It used to be that if you owned a small business and you made hamburgers and you were running the cash register and your son was making the hamburgers in the back room, then you would ring up two and put money in the pocket for the third. You ring up two, put money in your pocket. So you would skim manually by sitting at the cash register and only ringing up a few sales. Well, soon we had electronic cash registers and now we have something called sales suppression as a service. Now, the only, I thought of this word, because there are a number of sting operations that happened in the state of New York where they went around and looked for people in their cash registers and they found out that the person selling the cash register frequently to a business was also selling a service. And the service was, every three months we'll come in and destroy your cash register for you. We'll really pull out the hard drive, give you a new hard drive, and then when they come and do the audit, all the old records are gone. You just have to tell them that you spilled a Coca-Cola into the system. There were at least 25 sting operations in the state of New York. Of the people that they found selling cash registers in New York, 75% of them were at the same time selling this service. Well, there's another thing called phantomware. I sort of created this term too. Phantomware was, means you go in and you hire a guy from MIT to come in and reprogram your electronic cash register because an electronic cash register is really no different than a computer, a laptop. And so you just reprogram the computer to eliminate every third hamburger. Now that's a little bit easier than sitting at the cash register and putting the third, cash, third hamburger in your pocket. It also works an awful lot better if you have 17 restaurants because if you've got 17 restaurants, there's only one of you and there's 16 other people at the other cash registers. So if you had a phantomware application in your, in your cash register, you could take care of this thing digitally. 
You could simply at five o'clock when the business closes, you just eliminate some of the sales by the reprogramming of the computer. The problem with phantomware is it's embedded inside of the electronic cash register that if you've got a really, really good state auditor coming in, the state auditor can find the reprogramming in the computer. So what you do instead is you put the reprogramming on a, on a memory stick and you insert the memory stick into the side of the computer. And when the memory stick goes into the, into the computer, the cash register, it says, well, what would you like to do? And you say, well, I would like to reprogram my computer to eliminate all those extra hamburgers and the computer will do it for you. It reconstitute all your books and records, and at the end of the day, all you've got is the new records, not the old records. Zappers are everywhere. But zappers are only in places, really, where the government is chasing fraudsters. So there's no real reason to go into a zapper if you can simply put the money in your pocket by sitting at the cash register. Or there's no real reason to have a zapper if you have the ability to have the software company come in and destroy your cash register for you by replacing the hard drive inside of it. It's different options for it. Now, the only problem with the zapper is the zapper is on a memory stick, it's stuck in your pocket and they can find the memory stick. So there are instances, I wrote a paper, there's a woman in North Carolina where they just took the information by the internet off of her cash register system, put it into the cloud, reconstituted the records in the cloud, and then sent the money back, or sent the records back to her cash register um, over the internet. Her problem was the person doing the zapping wasn't her, the person doing the zapping was her business partner. She couldn't understand why they sold 100 hamburgers and there were only 50 recorded in the cash register system. It's because her friend was going in there at 2 o'clock at night and sending the digital stuff off onto the internet and was reconstituted and brought back. So, in Quebec, which is where they had this for a big problem, there are 500 new cases each year. There's 10,000 delinquent accounts and Quebec feels that they lost $425 million every year for the last 10 years in this type of fraud in restaurants only. What did Quebec do? Is Quebec said that we are going to require every restaurant in, this, in the province of Quebec to have a sales recording module, which is a device connected right to the cash register. And every time you type something into the cash register, the sales recording module takes the data, encrypts it, embeds it into the sales recording module, and then you get a printed receipt. The printed receipt that comes out at the other end has a code on the bottom of it. So the code at the bottom of the receipt identifies that this is a valid receipt made by this cash register at a particular time. And if you want to check the records, they're all inside of the sales recording module. They tried it in 46 restaurants in a pilot project in 2009. It worked pretty well. Then they had a full rollout, rollout in, in 2011. Results are published in 2013 and the increased revenue was $160 million in voluntary increases. They expect to get $2.3 billion over the next bunch of years simply by mandating that everybody have a sales recording module in their restaurants. They haven't done taxi cabs, they haven't done bars, they haven't done other things in Quebec yet. So there is a technology solution in order to prevent this type of retail sales tax fraud. They're not only stealing the retail sales tax, they're reducing their income tax because your gross sales are down. You also got extra cash hanging around, and what you use the extra cash for is to pay for people to work for you in cash, usually illegally, under the table. So, based on Quebec, what are the losses in the United States? Well, California loses 2.8 billion. New York loses 1.7 billion. Altogether, the United States, through this kind of fraud, is 21 billion dollars. I propose legislation with the state of New York. Legislation has passed in many of the states in the United States. We were up to, I think, about 20 states now requiring legislation to make installing of a zapper inside of a electronic cash register illegal with serious penalties. In Quebec, the serious penalties is a million dollars. In New York, the serious penalties and the bill hasn't passed yet is $100,000. Why? Because the guys in New York do not believe this is a problem yet because they can't find them. Why can't they find them? Because, because they're hard to find. This is all digital. This is not money that's stuck in the pocket. This could be done on the internet. This could be done by 
uh, a memory stick that's stuck in. So the auditors are saying, Richard, I'm having a real hard time finding these things. I'm saying, well, you better do a sting in order to find out who's selling the, the software under the table. And it says, yeah, we're going to try some stings. So this is a, what a zapper looks like. This is a zapper from the past. This is an old Quebec zapper, and you're going to see a zapper that's been hardwired into an electronic cash register. When they are done this way, it's very easy to find them. You just look for the yellow arrow. Um, you take off the top of the cash register and the yellow arrow points to the zapper. That's a joke. The, yeah, the yellow arrow points to something that's been hardwired inside of the cash register. And if you were looking for it and you took apart the cash register, you could find the actual hardwired thing inside of the cash register. These are old fashioned zappers. The modern zappers are all done with technology. They're all done with a memory stick that's stuck inside of them. But this is an old cash register. This is an old solution. All right. Now, this is a Swedish uh, backroom uh, POS system. Um, I got this from the Swedish tax administration. The zapper here is that little thing stuck into the side of the, of the laptop computer. They call it a dongle. Um, uh, and it's the, the program that's inside of it is called Resto Data. Um, it means something. Um, so <laughs> what it's designed to do is every day after the restaurant closes, it reconstitutes all the records that are happening inside of the restaurant. So before the manipulation, here's what happens. If you've never done anything like this, this is what an auditor does. He goes into something called the electronic journal. So let's take a particular example. Somebody went in in Sweden, because I can't read most of this stuff. It's all the Swedish guys. So if, I, if somebody goes into this restaurant, recording the electronic journal is somebody bought lunch B. Number 21 bought lunch B, and they paid 65,000 kroner, or 65 kroner. What, that's their currency that they got there. And then it also tells you, number three, this is the receipt. So every receipt is numbered. Everything that's purchased is numbered. All of the purchases are numbered. And you can see the tax calculation here. Um, then you go to uh, the sales report that would come out from them. It's all in Swedish here. And it tells you how many kroners worth of stuff that they sold during the year. The rabbit at the end is, uh, at the very end, I had to ask the Swedish guy what that was. That's a, that's a refund. Um, but that's how much they sold during the year. And then inside of the cash register, they also record all the tickets. Now, this is the exact same ticket. And so it's like number 21, there's $65, 65 kroner that they paid for the thing, and it's uh, number 2.1. So everything is tying together. The electronic records and the ticket report is all tying together. So after you stick in the zapper, here's what you do. It's again, it's all Swedish, guys. But there's a secret to this. <laughs> what it is, after you stick in the zapper, uh, and you press this button, this secret button that's on the face of the machine. Now, you would have to know that down here where it says OCH, whatever that means, underneath there is there's a hidden um, something or other, and then up pops this thing that's asking you for something else in Swedish, which is your ID and your password. So you type in your ID, you type in your password, you press the button OK, and what happens? Oh, it turns English. turns English because the guy that made this is not a Swedish guy. And what it then says is, here's your total sales, 40,000. Here's the total that you've removed so far, which is zero. And you can do this, you can, you can either fill in this blank over here that says, what's the amount that you'd like to remove? And then you have a button that also says, would you like us to remove it for you automatically? Or would you like to go back through the cash register receipts and pick out which ones you want to remove? So you have options here, but you need $500 for the weekend. So you probably in $500 in the button. You don't have a lot of time to say, you, you do it for me because I really can't go through all those receipts. But maybe you do know somebody's receipt that came in and bought something. And you said, well, that guy bought something for $580. So I'll just eliminate his receipt and put $585 in my pocket. So you have a choice. And then here's what you do. Uh, you're manipulating the electronic journal. Now, this is what the auditors are going through, looking to see if you've recorded the things properly. So you go through the electronic journal, and um, um, ticket 2.1, it's been changed from 65 to 45, so I took a reduction of 20. What I did was I changed the meal that I was having to a beer. So instead of having the, a special meal for 65, I had a beer for 20. And you notice the numbers are changed now down in the black spot down there. It's indicating that the total amount has been removed so far as 20. Um, you got a threshold amount of one kroner that's happening. 
Then what I do is I go to, I replace the lunch buffet for 65 with a beer for 45. Um, uh, MOM here is the tax in Sweden. I'm sorry, but the tax in Sweden is 25%. And some people say the tax is so high, it's an incentive to do this kind of fraud. But um, what we've done is we've done everything. We've recalculated the tax based on the beer rather than on the meal, and uh, we've put the money in our pocket. So now, if you compare the original with the manipulated, what you see is instead of having lunch B, what you have is a, is a beer for 45. And instead of seeing the original documents in the um, electronic journal, you see the manipulated documents in the electronic journal. It's just like erasing a paragraph in a paper that you've written. All honesty, if I wanted to get that paragraph that you erased from your computer to come back up on the machine, I would have to be a forensic uh, computer guy in order to drag that back up there. This is why the guys in the United States that are doing the sales tax audits, they say, look, Richard, the journal is fine, the tickets are fine, everything looks all right, how do I know this been a Zach reply? I says, well, it's really hard to do it. You've got to hire a computer guy. We don't have any budget to hire computer guys. So there's kind of a problem in finding these things unless you're really suspicious. But you can go back in and see the tickets. The tickets have changed too. So this is a record of each one of the tickets. Instead of having, instead of having a ticket for 65, you get a ticket of 45, you get a ticket of 900, um, and instead of 13, so your tax has gone down, your amount of sales have gone down. This was not exactly a smart guy that did this particular manipulation because he went from a meal to a beer. And the problem is beers are highly regulated. There's another system out there, particularly in the United States, the Alcoholic Beverage Commission, which tracks how many beers and bottles of liquor you're selling in your restaurant. He would be better off to go from um, one meal to a child's meal. So we would stay in the meal category and not cross the line into the liquor area. But you see the question marks after the 45? The question marks is how the Swedish found out that there was a manipulation going on here. Because the computer system itself was saying to people, 45, huh? Check this, it's not right. 900, ah, check this. It's, we don't think this is right. Something funny has happened to our system something has been playing with our data. So when the Swedish guys saw all the question marks in the electronic journal, they then pursued to see if there was a manipulation that happened, and they did find the manipulation, and then they assessed the guy. But it's, it's, it's a hard thing to go into the electronic records and start to look for this kind of stuff. So if you compare the ticket files, the same sort of thing happens. American Zapper cases. There's three big ones. The first one is Stu Leonard. Stu Leonard is the guy standing in between the chicken and the, and the, and, and the cow. People love Stu Leonard. He ran a series of uh, uh, grocery stores. They called it Stu Leonard's Dairy. It was in Southern Connecticut, really close to New York. They loved him because he dressed up in things. He, he had a great time, but he was stealing money from the business at the same time. He stole $17 million over 10 years, and he was shipping it to St. Thomas in the Virgin Islands in his suitcase, for goodness sakes. He was found by customs because he opened the suitcase and said, what the devil is all this money doing going to the Caribbean? Uh, a security guard that he fired called the customs agents and said, you better check the suitcase. So they found $17 million. Um, that's not the normal way you find people using this type of fraud, but the fraud was over the top. $20 million also by another character in um, the Detroit area who owned 17 restaurants called the Lashish restaurants, but he was siphoning off money and sending them in small denomination checks to Hezbollah. Um, he funded the widows and orphan funds in Lebanon, which if you were going to blow yourself up and you were gonna leave back wife and family, then somebody had to support the wife and family that was left over. So he supported the widows and orphans funded Hezbollah to the Sheik that we would saw at the beginning of the uh, demonstration here. Um, we don't know where he is. Uh, so Stu Leonard's dairy was a 1994 case. Um, it was a custom made zapper. Stu Leonard hired somebody from National Cash Register because he had National Cash Register machines in his restaurants. He hired a technology guy from National Cash Register to produce a zapper for him, and he kept the zapper in a hollowed out book. This is sort of like, this is, this is sort of like old spy novels. But he kept the zapper in a hollowed out book in his library, and every once in a while he'd stick the zapper in, change some money, and then go to Bermuda or the 
St. Thomas, uh, $17 million found by Customs. The Lachiche restaurant, it was kept at the owner's restaurants. He had 17 restaurants, so he sat in his bedroom and zapped all the stores from his bedroom. You can do it. There's another Romanian woman in Australia that did the same sort of thing. She would stay at home and zap her restaurants from the house. Um, the problem is you do have extra money left over, so you have to send somebody to the restaurant because there's too much money in the cash register and you need somebody to divide the money into two groups. Um, he skimmed uh, over four years, $20 million, sent it to Hezbollah and, and Lebanon. The reason they found this was because his sister-in-law happened to be a mole inside of the CIA because she spoke um, um, Arabic languages and they needed somebody at the time to do that. Um, his sister's in jail. His wife is also in prison right now. He is not around. We think he's back in Lebanon, but we still can't find him. There's an outstanding arrest warrant for him. Um, it's too bad that the women get caught and the guy left. There's another guy, Theodore Kramer. I didn't put any pictures of him because um, he put a zapper in strip clubs. Um, and um, he brought his zappers in Canada and brought them down to Detroit and installed them in all the strip clubs so that he could... Um, uh, walk away with money. He's in jail for five years, and if you work for a state revenue authority, if there's other people out there, uh, Mr. Kramer has a clause in his uh, imprisonment that says he will talk to state agencies to explain to them how these zappers work. So you just need to call that Mr. Kramer. Value-added tax fraud. Now it's shifting. So what you've seen is retail sales tax. You've seen retail sales taxes vulnerable in a particular place, which is the sale from the retailer to the final consumer. And you've also seen that this fraud has escalated from a fraud where I stick the money in my pocket because I'm running the cash register to putting technology inside of the cash register so that the technology can take the money much more effectively and change the records that are behind the scenes so that the audit is almost perfect. And I can do multiple restaurants. I don't have to do just one restaurant at a time. There's a current case going on in Ohio where a man from the Middle East decided to buy out a bunch of IHOP restaurants and the seven of them in Ohio, he installed zappers in them and did exactly the same thing. He zapped from his bedroom. He hired over 200 illegal immigrants to work in his restaurants, mostly from the Middle East. There's kind of a problem with this. So the Joint Terrorism Task Force is there, the FBI is there, everybody's investigating the IHOP restaurants in Ohio. So, if I go away from the retail sales tax and I go to the value-added tax, the type of fraud is called a missing trader fraud. Now, there's a number of types of missing traders that you can have out there. The traditional missing trader is MTIC, missing trader intercommunity uh, fraud. That's the traditional one, and it happens in goods. It traditionally happened in cell phones and tangible property that was sent across the border. They sort of missed it in the European Union by forgetting that there was another kind of thing that's taxed under the value-added tax, which is services. Services can also go across the border. I wrote a paper before the fraud broke. Again, this happens in Italy with VOIP fraud, which is voice over internet protocol, and VOIP fraud is a service, and when it crosses a border, it doesn't have to say inside the European Union. It can be external from the European Union. So I wrote one paper, then the Italians found the fraud, then I wrote another paper, and it was, a, it was at the time a very significant Italian fraud, 400 billion euros. It was really run by the mafia from Sicily, um, and it was using very prominent companies in Italy to do it. So it was um, um, Italian telecom was involved heavily in the whole thing. So you can have a missing trader. So if you estimate how much is lost by missing trader fraud in the European Union, this is number is way off, low. It's 100 billion euros is lost in the European Union every year, according to you know, the Serious Organized Crime and Threat, threat uh, Force, uh, it's low. Altogether, the tax gap in the European Union is 193 billion. So if we're using these numbers, European Union loses 193 billion dollars, every billion euros in a year through various types of problems with the system, and 100 billion of it is coming from missing trader fraud. So this is a big part of what Europe's problem is. So we saw this problem already before, right? This is the old example. 
So the manufacturer buys something for 25, he pays 2.5 in fees. So if I've got a value added tax of 10%, everybody along the line is paying 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%. Now, if you know from the retail sales tax that there is one place that's highly vulnerable, which is the sale from the retailer to the final consumer, I'm sorry, in the value added tax, you've got multiple points where the tax is being collected. There's multiple opportunities to participate in this fraud. So here's the way it goes. And here's where the problem is. Assume that the UK has a value-added tax of 10%, which is like the old problem, and assume that Germany has a value-added tax of 20%. Well, in fact, they're both probably closer to 20% now, but to make the example work, assume that one is at 10% and the other is at 20%. This is a tax on final consumption. So final consumption happens in Germany, and I'm looking for a tax on that 160 in Germany at 20%. So the total amount of revenue that's supposed to be collected is 20% of 160. Trouble is, some of this started in the UK. It started in the UK at 10%. So I've got a problem with the numbers, the mathematics working out, particularly when something crosses the border. So the European solution is this. The guy in the UK who's the manufacturer that has input of 25 and pays tax in the UK at 10%, which he's going to pay now 25 plus 2.5, he's going to pay that out. And then when the goods go across the border, as long as he can prove that there actually been an export from the UK into another member state of the European Union, he's going to be allowed to zero rate that out of the UK. In other words, it will be taxed, but the tax will be zero. So this guy in the UK is going to have paid 2.5 in tax for his manufacturing inputs, and he has sold it to somebody else in the European Union and collected no tax. As a result, the manufacturer will apply to the UK Treasury for a refund of 2.5, and he'll get his refund. So you get a check in the mail if you export out of the UK into Germany. Now the problem is I get to Germany and I've got an importer in Germany. Now the importer in Germany paid for this item that was manufactured in the UK and he paid 100. But he didn't pay any value added tax because the value added tax rate was zero. So now I have goods coming into Germany with no tax on top of it. That's kind of a problem with the value added tax. Plus I've also lost 2.5 because that's stuck in the UK. But it's at the wrong rate anyways. I don't want 2.5, I want twice 2.5, I want five because I got a 20% tax in, in Germany. So the way the rule goes is the, the first guy importing into Germany does it twice. He pretends that he's buying the stuff and selling the stuff to himself. So W, which is the wholesaler in Germany, files, I'm selling this to myself. got something worth a hundred and I'm going to sell it to myself for a hundred and the tax on it's going to be 20 the German rate at the same time on the same return he can say and then this thing that I bought and was paid tax on of 20 I sold it to R and R paid 30 because the price was 150 and 20 percent of 130 is 150 is 30 so he files his return and says in my first transaction, I'm paying 20. In my second transaction, I'm paying the difference between 30 and 20 because I paid on my inputs of 20 and I collected on my outputs of 30. So altogether, this first guy, W in Germany, submits a return and pays 30 to the German government. Then W pays R and there's another two and the consumer winds up paying 32 because effectively this thing is burdened with a tax of 20% on 160. So I still write back at the same place, but when I cross the border, I have myself a problem because some of the money was stuck in the UK at a different rate and the Germans wanted 20% on everything. So he wanted 20% on the entire value added chain. So I have this glitch that happens when it crosses the border. That's why this is missing trader intercommunity fraud. And so this is really the same sort of diagram in here that 30 is collected from W. Notice that there's two transactions that happen. W sells and buys to and from W. So this is an internal transaction. And then W sells on to R. There is a thing called carousel fraud that if this thing goes all the way through the European Union, what would happen if I replace the consumer, D, with a business? Then 
M manufactures, sells to W, which is the wholesaler, sells to retailers, and then sells to D. And what D winds up doing is exporting it out of Germany. Now, if I export this thing back to the UK, I've created a circle. So the thing started in the UK, went all the way through Germany, I collected some taxes, and then it went out of, the U out of Germany back to the UK. It went around and around in a circle, which is fine, except if W is missing, and that's your missing trader, and W was supposed to send in 30, but he didn't send in 30, but W did stay around long enough to create a valid invoice. He says, I'm a business, I'm W, I work in Germany, and I'm going to send an invoice off to R. And the invoice that goes off to R says, 150. Pay me 20% on 130 in addition. So R sells, sends to W 30. What does W do? Puts in his pocket and goes home. If W is a good friend of R, and is also a good friend of D, and is also a good friend of M, and I want to run this thing around in a circle again and again and again and again. Every time it goes through W, you put 30 in your pocket and you go, 30 in your pocket, 30 in your pocket, 30 in your pocket, and you just keep doing this until the government finds you. How are they going to find you? You didn't submit a return. You sent an invoice off to R, and so when you audited R, you said, let me see your invoices. And you got a valid invoice from it's only if you're smart enough to say, oh yeah, this is an invoice. Let me go back and check to see if W really exists because it looks like a good invoice. It looks valid. And you really did pay this money. It came out of your bank account. I can see the checks leaving, leaving R's bank account and going over to M. So the money did leave. There really was a payment. There really was cash on the other end. I just can't find W any longer. Oh, and by the way, uh, no money really leaves this system because when D does his export out of Germany, he gets his money back. So D gets a full refund. And so we start the whole thing all over again. This happened with cell phones all the time. There once upon a time was a guy in Ireland who was in his mid-20s who sold more computer chips back and forth between Ireland and the UK than anybody else in Ireland. And then anybody else in the European Union. And then anybody else in the European Union and Asia, he just sold computer chips back and forth, back and forth, back and forth between Ireland and the UK. It was a complete circle. Collected the tax every time it went through. They only found it because he got a little bit arrogant and he would put smiley faces on his box every time the box left Ireland. And one customs guy, when the box broke in the UK, said, I've seen this box before. He says, yeah, I got 40 smiley faces on the top of the whole thing. The box fell apart, and they decided that must be something wrong because the computer chips inside of it were all on the floor, and they wanted to find the guy, and they couldn't find the guy any longer, but he was very wealthy. So, I met this guy whose name's Ashley Seeger. He no longer works there. He used to work for this um, a newspaper called The Guardian in the UK, so I went and talked to him and stuff like that. He did a really wonderful article. This is back in 2006, and so Ashley is talking to a guy that's involved in cell phones. And he gets the guy in the corner and he says, explain to me how this whole thing works. And the guy says, he says, you can't believe it. I can turn this carousel in just 10 minutes, and then you just have to wait 30 days for the money to show up. He says, you can run around five different companies, but I got 300 different companies in my laptop over here. Um, each spin gives you about 200,000 pounds, and long as it stays in any bank is about two hours, you can move the money so fast, the scale of it is beyond comprehension. He says, this is how it works. I just do it in my computer. And I just got the companies here. I don't even have to have a real business. I just have to have registered companies in various places. Uh, this guy doesn't do it any longer because the Russian mob showed up at his door and they wanted his computer program. And he says, I'm getting out of the business. It was just too easy to make too much money. Uh, his friend um, had a broken leg. Um, so then what we have in the European Union is CO2 permits. Now, in the early days, this type of fraud was done with tangible property, real cell phones, real um, uh, computer chips. But the only problem with cell phones and computer chips and tangible property and the MTIC fraud is you really have to get it on an airplane and ship it from the UK to Germany. And you have to pay a little bit of money for the airplane to get it to Germany. Wouldn't it be better if it was dealing with something else that didn't have to be shipped anyplace? So we have the cap and trade program in the European Union, where if you decide that you want to 
not uh, be uh, uh, bad for the environment, uh, what you do is you get these permits that allow you to pollute in the European Union. And if you decide you're not going to pollute an awful lot more because you're going to put in sun panels, you have extra permits left over because the government gives you the permits based on your current activity that's going on. But if you have extra permits, you can sell the right to pollute to somebody else. So if Volkswagen wants to build something else that has a big bunch of smokestacks to it and they need some permits. So they don't have enough permits because this is an expansion of the Volkswagen plant. You go and buy it from somebody else that has extra permits. The permits are digital. They're a service. When they cross the border, they're zero rated. So if a permit is sold from the UK to Germany for a hundred, there's no tax on it. The person that buys the permit in Germany has to do a reverse charge. He has to pay the 30 into the government. If he decides to go missing, well, there's no tax return, there's no tangible property, there's nothing to audit. He's in Dubai, and they don't have an extradition treaty in Dubai. It takes three months in order for the returns to be filed. It takes another two months in order to have a conversation with the tax authorities. So I've got five months where I can do these transactions, and there is absolutely positively no record of this thing. All I'm selling is digital code from one guy in the UK to another guy in Germany. This is heaven for a fraudster who likes technology and understands how missing trader fraud works. So, you have a registry, and the registry is entirely, this is from the, this is from the UK. The UK is explaining how this thing works. You just have to register yourself with the registry, and you can buy and sell these, these certificates. So the registry is an electronic web-based system holding and transferring greenhouse gas emission allowances. These allowances exist only in electronic form. So I'm selling digital codes between the UK and Germany, and I'm charging a price for it. And somebody is paying the VAT, and I'm putting the VAT in my pocket. So what happened? Once upon a time, we were looking for Osama, but he wasn't around. And one time in 2010, uh, sometimes this is called a cave. But it's really not a cave, it's sort of like a house, but it's a hideaway. Inside of the hideaway, he wasn't there. But the stuff that was there, when the US and the UK um, secret forces went in, was a whole bunch of papers. And in the papers was a documentation of Italian bat fraud, which is dealing in CO2 permits. This is a story that's currently breaking down in the European Union. So we find this stuff in 2010 in this place in the border between Pakistan and, uh, and Afghanistan. Osama lives down the street a little bit. They had the wrong house, but they found the house that one of his friends was in. Um, they're still looking for his friend. Um, Osama passes away in 2011. And um, soon after that, the guys from the UK take a visit to the people in Italy and say, by the way, <laughs> One of the things we discovered was the names of these people and these companies were involved in some sort of arrangement in Italy, and I think you've lost a lot of money. So, there is this investigation. It came out 16 days ago. It is an internal memo. I'm not supposed to have this memo, but it's on the internet. I'm sorry. I got it from a newspaper reporter. I can't really read much, an awful lot of Italian, but eventually I will do that. Um, it only came out in as a notice of an investigation and some conclusions that they reached after the investigation. This is just an audit finding. This is not a conclusion. These guys aren't guilty. They haven't been uh, held up in court, but it's an incredibly interesting document. Um, it says that 1.15 billion euros were ripped off by this group that was living in this house someplace in Afghanistan um, and then looking for certain individuals. This is a young man's business. Most of these guys are in their 30s. Um, some guys are younger that do it in their 20s, but you have to be a little bit agile and not have a you know, fixed family location and stuff. But these are all UK guys. So these are UK Pakistani people that they're looking for that were related to that stuff. There seems to be two little groups in this thing. Um, one, little, one group appears to be an Anglo-Pakistani group that is siphoning CO2 permits into this uh, fraud that's happening. Another one is a Franco-Israeli uh, criminal organization that's siphoning material into here. I have no idea what the Israeli people are going to do when this thing becomes public because eventually 
you're going to find Israeli people that were participating in a fraud that was funding Al Qaeda. Um, it's not exactly the best place to be in, but that's the way it is. So the alleged fraud pattern went like this. This gets a little bit complicated. It starts in the UK at a company called Pan Energy Marketing, goes to World Base Trading, which is a buffer company in Dubai. It then gets sold to another company in the Stock Complete, which is a buffer company in Portugal. Then it goes to a company called Euro Trading. This is your first company inside of Italy. This is going to be the missing trader. So these certificates travel around and travel around, and travel around, and then bingo, they go into this missing trader. This is the company that's going to disappear in Italy. So he collects the, he crosses the border from Portugal into Italy. There's no VAT imposed on the certificates. This is all digital, guys. It's all happening inside of a computer. So there is a computer that says they did the, 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 this CO2 permit that was owned by somebody in Portugal is in Portugal and it is going to be sold to somebody else who is in Italy and it's going to cross the border between Portugal and Italy. There's no VAT imposed on this. So it's stuck inside of Italy. So this guy that imports it into Italy pays no VAT, but he sells it to somebody else in line who has to pay VAT because the next guy in line is Italian because it's happening inside of Italy. So one Italian sells to another Italian, then the Italian number two has to pay the VAT. And then they sell it to another buffer company, which is in Italy. Then they sell it to SF Energy, which is another buffer company in Italy, which is what some of these other guys on the other page own. Then they sell it to somebody that's called the distributor. In this world, the distributor is the guy who's going to export it outside of Italy. So this is coming around, comes into Italy. There's a missing trader, sells to another one, sells to another one, sells to another one, and then it's exported outside of Italy. So effectively, if you can't find the person who imported these digits into Italy and find the tax that should have been reported for that, you've lost your money. This then goes to Switzerland, and the bulk of it goes to a uh, French company, BNP Paribas. Um, it's a big bank. Um, they I don't see the whole chain for this thing yet. I only see parts of it. And there's only parts of it that are in the newspaper things too. And we don't even know if this is true or not. That sounds kind of true. Um, so there's a solution. I've written about this solution a bunch of times. My proposed solution is called DICE, Digital Invoice Customs Exchange. Invo each invoice must have a digital signature. DICE collects the data on the transactions in real time. Um, the data collection happens in advance of the transaction. There's a remote risk, risk assessment can be performed. Tax administrations can block the suspect transactions. This is done very much already in Brazil and Chile. Um, I made the proposal that Rwanda adopted and they did and Rwanda's revenue went up by 16% in six months. Um, it's also being used in Croatia. Um, here's how the system works. If we're in Poland, for example, and B, the seller, wants to sell something to Z, who's also in Poland, what would happen under this system is B will notify the Ministry of Finance that I want to sell something. Here's what it is. Here's I'm going to sell it. Give me a digital code. You just send it into the computer. The computer encrypts it and sends you back a password. The password comes back to B. Then what B does is it says to Z, I've already registered this transaction with the Polish Ministry of Finance or whatever it is, and here's my code. And if you want to check to see if this is a legitimate transaction, then go to the Ministry of Finance with this secret code, and you can see that the transaction that I'm talking to you about is already recorded in the Ministry of Finance. Then what Z does is it goes to the Ministry of Finance and checks it. Then what, then what happens is um, the Ministry of Finance says, yes, you have contacted to us about this transaction. We know that you're Z. We know that you're the second side of the transaction. And here is your password that says you've already been to the Ministry of Finance and checked your transaction. Then the Ministry of Finance sends this code back to B, who is the seller. And now the seller knows, I want to sell something to Z. I've already registered with the Ministry of Finance. The guy that wants to buy it from me already has registered himself with the Ministry of Finance. And I can check that he's registered thing with the Ministry of Finance. This takes three seconds. Happens in Brazil all the time. I gave a presentation in California and did this. Except my device was in California and the revenue administration that I used was the Ivory Coast. 
I not only registered my transaction with the Ivory Coast, I sent it to the Ivory Coast and went into the back door of the Ivory Coast computers and checked and confirmed the transaction was correct and it took less than five seconds to do it. Sitting in the front row of the audience was Revenue Quebec. Next week, Revenue Quebec went to the Ivory Coast because this is better than what they have in Quebec. So after this whole transaction takes place, it only takes place in three seconds, then you issue the back invoice. This is the real document where B then sells to Z, and on the document are the two codes. One code that says I notified them, the other code says the other guy notified them. So that's a domestic transaction. As a result, missing trader fraud is stopped. A domestic buyer will insist on getting a valid invoice from B because he needs to register the transaction and he needs that if I pay the VAT, I have to pay the VAT on a valid invoice, not a bogus invoice, and the only way I can prove that I got a valid invoice is if I have the codes on the top of my invoice. Right? In addition, the tax administration has early notice of every transaction that happens in the country. It's all digital, it's all encrypted. There's no, there no people watching somebody else's transactions, but if all of a sudden I notice that this company, which used to be a laundromat, is now dealing in cell phones for a billion dollars worth of cell phones. They got cases like this in the, in the UK. Where all of a sudden this Chinese laundry turns into a laundry that's selling cell phones. But they don't sell a couple of cell phones. They sell a billion dollars worth of cell phones. And you know what? The Chinese guys who used to run the laundry aren't there anymore. It's a bunch of Russian guys that took over the laundromat and decided, well, we're going to do a little bit of laundry, but what we're really going to do is sell cell phones. So if you notice that the laundry all of a sudden has a billion dollars worth of cell phones going through the transactions, you spot that and you stop those transactions by you denying the code that goes through on the digital transaction. So what happens cross-border? Cross-border is the same sort of thing. A, the seller sells to the minister. This requires cooperation, though. And this is where the problem is in the European Union. They all think that they're separate countries, <laughs> but they're not supposed to be separate countries. So in the UK, you report to Her Majesty's Revenue and Customs. The transaction is going to happen in Poland. Her Majesty's Revenue and Customs now has to send off to the Polish people. By the way, we've got notification that A wants to sell something to this guy that's in Poland. So that's cool. And then you send back the codes that says, yes, we've got this sort of thing. And then B, the guy in Poland, says, I want to buy something from the UK. And here's the thing I want to buy. And here's the digital part of the transaction. So B, the buyer, then sells to the Polish Ministry of Finance that I'm going to buy this stuff from the guy in the UK. It goes off to the people in the UK. And I exchange the same sort of thing that happens, but it happens across the border. The difficulty in doing it cross-border is I've got to get cooperation of the Polish government with the UK government on exchanging encrypted codes of the types of transactions, but it happens in real time. And then after that happens, uh, the, the files are changed, the real digital invoice goes out, it has the codes encrypted on it. I can now look at the invoice and verify the invoice was correct with the two revenue administrations in real time right away, and I can do my audit. The proposal in the East African community is, now Rwanda is part of the East African community. The other countries are Kenya and Uganda and Tanzania and Brunei. Yes. These are not big countries in the world, but they are probably going to put in place a system to prevent that fraud that the European Union, which is a developed bunch of countries, haven't done yet. And the reason we're doing it in the East African community is because I can't convince the Europeans that I have a solution to their problem because I'm an American and we don't have a bad and that kind of stuff. But if the guys in Africa can do the same thing and solve the problem, there are some people that can get convinced when you show them. Some people can get convinced when you tell them. I think with the European Commission, I'm at the position of showing them that it works. But I've got a group of companies, countries in Africa that might want to do that. So there's the whole thing. MTIC is is stopped because the intercommunity seller A will insist on issuing a valid invoice in another member state in order to get their refunds and there's an early notification system. So what we have is a system that is vulnerable to fraud and vulnerable particularly to technology fraud and it is both the retail sales tax and the value added tax is vulnerable and what you need is a technology solution in order to solve the problem. You need to get the data, encrypt it, and save it. And so that you did the audit by encrypting the data at the end. So this is that for the, 
this presentation. If you're interested in this topic anyplace out there, email me. If you want to work on some sort of research in this area, email me because I'm still doing the Italian documents anyways. Um, we'll do some other lectures on this. You should be able to get both PowerPoints and the audio video for this thing. I should have a transcript available for you and there'll be another director's lecture series in a bit. But this is how it works at Boston University for our hybrid program for the long distance people, for the inline in residence people, they get to sit in the classroom like the 50 that are here, or the in residence, uh, the, uh, um, the distance people, um, they have to listen to this on a video recording. But um, this is what we do. Thanks for coming.